Have we got the recording on? Now the recording is on. Excellent. Okay. Well, this is the April meeting of the WebRTC working group. We started a little bit early since it's only March 30th. Just a reminder of the W3C IPR policy. We abide by it and only people and companies listed on that webpage are allowed to make substantive contributions to the WebRTC specs. So today we're gonna hope to make progress on features at risk, uh, privacy concerns, and we also have some new work relating to audio acquisition, which Sam will be talking about. A little bit about the meeting. Um, this is the basic info. We have a link to the slides on the wiki. Um, we do need a scribe for today. Do we have a volunteer? Is Dom around to scribe? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, and then there are links to the various drafts. Okay, so here's uh, what we're gonna try to do today. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about features at risk. I'll cover that. Um, two issues from over to CPC. Um, then we have media capture and streams and Sam will present on audio acquisition. Then we'll have some other uh, privacy issues. So that's the agenda for today. Okay, so let's talk about Weber GC PC first and um, I'll go on the features at risk. So there are a few unimplemented features that are not yet marked as features at risk, but probably should be. Uh, and there are three issues Dom um, has filed relating to that. The first one is the voice activity flag. You may recall this is exposed in the RTC RTP synchronization source. Uh, but as far as I know, nobody implements it. Uh, so do we have agreement from the group that this should be marked at risk? I didn't see any objections in the issue. Sounds good to me. Okay, so we'll mark that one. Um, the second is, I think we have one unimplemented MTI stat, which is partial frames lost. Um, there were a couple that uh, Dom put in this issue 2497 that have been moved elsewhere, so that's why uh, they didn't get picked up. Um, I think that's accurate, right, Henrik? Only just one, the partial frames lost? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's, mar uh, it's marked MTI, and the question is whether we're going to get around to doing it um, or not. Uh, are there objections to marking this one, uh, removing the MTI designation for this one, and also implementing it, at, uh, indicating it at risk? Or is it just, hold on, Dom, was the goal here just to remove the MTI designation? I guess there's no such thing as stats at risk, right? Uh, yeah, I think the more logical thing would be to remove the MTI flag. Yeah, just remove the MTI. Uh, any objections? So, yeah. Uh, no objection to this one. Just wondering if weren't there a couple of other ones? Uh, well, there were, but they uh, there were, but they were implemented. Okay. Uh, they just got moved, so that's I guess I guess the issue is we had some tests that failed because they got moved. I'm not sure. Anyway. No. So we they've been moved to a different stats dictionary. Right. But, right. Uh, the web platform tests have probably not been updated. And the yeah, that was the issue. That's why they failed, right. Being updated, like work in progress. Yeah, so they actually were implemented. Good. So the, the essence of them are implemented, but they're in the wrong place. And I don't, I don't think that should be uh, at risk because of that. Yeah, yeah, the issue here is really just fixing the test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, OK. Uh, so, that one, yeah. so just yeah. for clarity, I don't think it's just fixing the test. Uh, I have a pending pull request, which indeed fixed the test. Oh, okay. But as far as I can tell, uh, they are still not there in the fixed test. Uh, and uh, I heard Henrik say that they also need to be moved. So yes, that so may suffice in fixing the test, but it's not just the test that has an issue. Yeah, the, the implementations need to be updated in order to pass the test. 
but um ah okay like the the meat of the implementation the actual logic is there it's just being exposed in the wrong object which we obviously obviously have to to fix that but it's it's not one of those not implemented it's it's just need to move it it's not lacking proof of concept right it's not lacking right. proof of concept Okay. Uh, Yaniva, uh, I know that you had consulted with one of your colleagues. Have, have you had a chance to get back to him to ask whether that matches understanding? Uh, it's still not clear to us. Uh, we're working off. Uh, we're not working off of tip on libwebrdc, so we're not sure um, if uh, the fact that Chrome has it implemented will speed up our implementation or not yet. Um, Thanks. But if we could get some pointers to what parts of up, upstream is being used, that might help. But we could take that offline. OK. So I, I think we have consensus to just remove the MTI designation on partial frames lost. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Uh, and the last one is 2498, which is multiple D DTLS certificates. The WT test fails because I don't think any browser implements this, and it's not a particularly high priority. Um, I think that's an accurate statement of where we are. So not likely to get get this implemented anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, um, I haven't heard anyone ask for it uh, ever since. Yeah, neither and, have and I, I, honestly. <laughs> and I feel like it was a bit uh, underspecified. It was like, if you give multiple certificates, uh, you may use any one of them. It doesn't say which one. So. Right. The implementation yeah. is always in Chrome to just pick the first one. So I think it makes more sense to not support multiple ones. Yeah, I have never encountered. My memory says that this was uh, part of trying to support uh, signed certificates. So, uh, oh, signed uh, certificates? Oh, my god. Oh, yes. And uh, of course, that's woefully underspecified. So yes, so, uh, wow. we, 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 should, we should just uh, mark it that risk and be done with it. Yeah. Yes. Well, no, if no, it's not if... for science, science certificate, really. Right. Yeah, that so was some it... weird. That was a weird gateway feature, right? Uh, um, yeah. Anyway. So just to clarify the impact of removing the features, my understanding is that we would not change the API, but we would change the spec to say pick the first certificate of that list. Is that correct? Because right now the, the API expects right, a list right. of Right, right. It's a secret. Right. Yeah, no it's a list. Yeah, that's my understanding. Yes. Yeah. If you wanna, if you wanna avoid uh, implementations having to update, then you would say to use the first element in the list rather than to change the API to take right. one element. Yeah. So do we have consensus that that's what we want to do? So not just mark it at risk, but actually change the spec to just kind of get rid of it. I've never heard anybody use this. I've never seen any app that understood any reason why we would even do this. So, Does the spec need to forbid having more than one, or is it enough to merely say that uh, we must implement one? Uh, or, or, uh, or yeah. so I'm just one. wondering if, if we want to have an ex we don't want to block future extension specs. So I think the wasn't the background of this that you could have multiple kinds of certificate and you didn't have to support like you know you didn't have to support ECDH so you you could offer more than one and then whatever the far end could deal with it would take I mean I don't think anybody's doing it I don't think it's relevant but I thought I think that was the background well that might have been one of the reasons during the transition but since everyone's got to be on DTLS 1.2 right we're kind of removing all the right. old junk exactly it's it's not relevant anymore. Yeah, I remember having that upgrade discussion about uh, Sha Wang. Yeah, but that's hopelessly in the past. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Let's let's hope at least. Anyway, <laughs> I guess we'll find out if we once we remove everything. Um, okay, so I think we have consensus on all of these. Uh, All right, over to you, Yanivar. All right, thank you. So, um, so this is a problem that came up while writing uh, web platform tests for perfect negotiation. Um, 
but it's really more um, a criticism of the API itself. And, um, and you know, web platform test is often where we first <clears throat> try to use these um, APIs uh, in a try to use it in a deterministic manner. Uh, so uh, it would, so just to back up a little bit, perfect negotiation is this uh, pattern we recommend now in the spec where we take full advantage of the negotiation needed event, <coughs> which lets an application, excuse me, <coughs> which lets an application uh, abstract away the negotiation logic from the rest of its application so that you can do modification methods on pair connection objects on both sides and ex expect them to be just negotiated. So how, so you can call pc.add transceiver, for example, to add a video transceiver. And then uh, you can just uh, wait a while, or you know, at some point, this will be negotiated. And the benefit here is that uh, perfect negotiation takes care of glare. And negotiation can get complicated because it's an asymmetric uh, stateful exchange that happens between two peers, network involved. So it can actually be quite complicated to know when negotiation has actually happened and when you your new transceiver has a, not just the direction, <clears throat> which is uh, application input, but the current direction that's actually has been negotiated and that you know that the other peer also has this, uh, this transceiver now in the new state. So you want to uh, await some event or promise so that you can then test that this transceiver now has a current direction of send only, for example, which is what the specs test. So next slide. So um, another problem, why I think this is a problem, is because this is getting this right in application code can be quite difficult. And I suspect a lot of people, just like what perfect negotiation was trying to solve was to avoid people writing racy code because negotiation is so complicated. <clears throat> uh, the, the obvious approach is racy outside of highly controlled cases. So a point was made on the list that you know, well, web platform tests are highly controlled cases. So. Uh, this is not. This is less about web platform tests. This is more about uh, uh, writing APIs that are not racy and having good APIs. And in fact, this particular web platform test does. It's a bit of has some of tests that are kind of like stress tests to make sure that, and they're not always highly deterministic because you want to make sure that, for instance, add transceiver can be called at any point and negotiation will never be missed and never cause a double negotiation. So what we've been doing so far in tests is basically add transceiver and then wait for signaling state to go back to stable. A couple of problems with that. <clears throat> uh, we might actually reach stable from rollback or from answering a remote offer that came in. So again, this, this is all JavaScript is single threaded, but we still have these asynchronous methods that take time. So uh, if you had like an, a button with on click and then you did an add transceiver, you have to imagine that you should be able to click this button at any time. And regardless of which queued task you end up in between, you want to make sure that nothing goes wrong and nothing is missed and you don't produce any unnecessary errors. <clears throat> so um, also, you, we could have just missed a negotiation previously, the, the negotiation train, right? So you call add transceiver once, and then uh, some time passes and a negotiation needed event fires. It starts, now you're suddenly preparing an offer or you're in uh, you're not in a stable signaling state, and then you hit the button again, and now you add a second transceiver. <clears throat> uh, that transceiver then is going to require negotiation, but it just missed the negotiation train that left the station. So if you then do a wait for stable state, you're going to arrive at stable state sooner than when you're, and, and your transceiver is not going to be negotiated. So you wait, you have to wait for the next train. So next slide. So I tried to. Um, so you can write. You can you can work around this. You can do a spin test, but those are specific to the uh, the action that you're doing. Uh, all my examples here use add transceiver, but the same could be said for create data channel or restart ice or any other uh, method you want to do. So having to write spe action specific tests that basically while loop. You do add transceiver, and then while I don't have the result I want, I wait and the bad thing about that is that you know uh, you don't know either it works or you time out basically, and that's that's bad for tests, but that's also bad in general. Uh, next slide. So as a workaround, I tried to dispatch my. This is some of the stuff I tried to do, which is uh, in the JavaScript perfect negotiation pattern. 
uh, at the third last to last line, I dispatch an event called negotiated, and I only do it from set remote description answer, which is of the four cases of negotiation methods, the one where I know that an offer that I sent came back with an answer on my side, which means all my stuff will be up to date up to a point. So that takes care of rollback and, uh, and remote offers. And uh, next slide. And now, now I can do, but but it, we still have to account for missing local trains. So this is slightly better in that we don't have a while loop anymore, but we still have, we add transceiver, we uh, await a negotiated event that we just created. And then we checked current direction once. So it's built, still action specific, but it's not a spin loop anymore. So, and if, if we didn't get the result, we have to wait one more train. So it's, you know, that's as good as I could get. Uh, next slide, but it's still not good enough. <clears throat> so can we do better? So I have three proposals. <clears throat> and I should also say that in in finding out when negotiation need, is needed is actually complete can be tricky because let's say you click this button often, you might create ad, create ad transceivers many times and it could take a while, especially not on a local machine, but on a real network, it might actually take a while to negotiate. And so getting this right seems uh, tricky. So proposal A, fire negotiation complete event from set remote description answer, only if renegotiation is needed. As you may recall, we have in set remote description, we have this code that once we go back to stable, we check if, if negotiation is need, still needed. And if it is, we queue a task to fire another round of negotiation. So somewhere in there, we would add logic to, to fire negotiation complete event if we're really complete and there's no more negotiation needed. And it's simple. Uh, one downside is that subsequent, subsequent actions may delay this event. I mentioned earlier, if you had an transceiver called in the middle of this, it would now need another round of negotiation. That's also going to delay this event. So that's... It's uh, simple, but it still has a lot of problems because it can lead to further delays. Now, these are you could argue these are edge cases. We don't care that much. Proposal, uh, next slide, please. Proposal B is similar. It's to expose a negotiation needed Boolean attribute. And then instead of receiving an event, you can sort of do the dance. You can do a while loop, but uh, specifically on the APC negotiation needed event. So you come back to stable and you check yourself in JavaScript, is negotiation still needed? Then I have to wait for another train. Uh, this is the benefit that it's not uh, action specific. You can use this for create that channel and so forth. Uh, one complication for writing this into the spec is that we have to be a little careful in implementations because once you expose this Boolean to JavaScript, we then must fire the negotiation needed event later. The way we have it right now, we're queuing a chain we actually make a determination later whether we should or not, and we'd have to fix that. And it also has the same downside that subsequent actions may delay everything selling. So that takes us to proposal C, next time. So this is proposal C. Um, it exposes a negotiation complete promise attribute. We haven't had these except in the identity spec where we had a PR identity where it's actually an attribute on the PC that is a promise object. <clears throat> and so you do the same thing. You do add transceiver, and then you await this negotiation complete promise. And this is better than the previous proposals because this fulfillment of this new promise would not be delayed by subsequent actions. And the way we would accomplish that internally is a bit convoluted, but uh, users shouldn't have to worry. Basically, we would the browser would replace the attribute with a new promise each time a negotiation treated train leaves the station. So that means that if you call add transceiver twice once and the first one triggers a negotiation train and then a second add transceiver comes uh, using the same code here, they would be waiting on different promises. <clears throat> a question, if you go back to, to two slides to proposal A, Sure. That's the same, except you don't have this. You have the train thing, right? You you mm -hmm. 
you fire an event when you're completed and you say one downside is the subsequent actions may delay the event. Uh, this refers to when you, you, you miss the train and you and an ongoing negotiation will happen before you know that you're completed. So you don't know that you you were partially completed before, right? Right. <clears throat> right. And and then if you go forward to slide the, the next slides again, the proposal C, that's, oh, that's uh, well, the benefit, let me, right? Let me clarify, yes. So proposal A, it's not that terrible. It just means that uh, you, the example you gave, what you called at transceiver twice, let's call them, you know, at trans, you know, once and twice, uh, that negotiation complete promise, uh, sorry, event will be fired once when they're both done. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Then I understand it correctly. I like proposal A more than proposal C because um, I think the important thing, uh, like, I want to know when am I in a good, like, basically, in a, I don't hate to use the word stable, but a stable state. Like, I don't have to do any more uh, uh, negotiation. Whereas if I care about something partial, like has this specific transceiver been negotiated, uh, I can I can sh add logic for that specific thing. Well, so, I would say the opposite. I would say if you have proposal C, you also get uh, A. Because yeah, you, you, you can get, then immediately. You get A right. for free. I'm just questioning the additional complexity in it because mm -hmm. uh, if, if I want to know if a specific thing is negotiated, it's easy to check that manually whereas if i want just in general mm. to know am i done yet which i'd probably want to know for debugging then it's good enough to just have this one event fire how well I, I would say I would actually question the question the question question the question in in that when is negotiation complete and uh, my my question would be why should i care right that's that's the proposal d is that we don't solve this so, uh, and, uh, no, no, give, give me a few more moments uh, in that uh, what you have here is yes uh, it's a it's a problem but it's but the problem is for the application is not whether negotiation is complete or not it's whether, whether you can whether the transceiver is uh, uh, connect is connected to a to a live channel or not right I mean, right with, with the right. data channels you don't have this problem because there's a nice open event that fires when, when, right. when the machinery has decided that the, that, that the data channel is open. So I would I would claim that uh, the example <laughs> given so far in that transceiver uh, is uh, if we want to solve it at all. I mean, I I don't like adding new API ever uh, at this point. Uh, but if we want to solve it at all. We should think about uh, this transceiver is now connected to a to a use, usable channel. That is, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, but don't don't you get some of that same info, Harold? From the uh, you're going to get that from our existing states, won't you? Like well, in the uh, transports. That, that's what Jan Iver is claiming that claiming that we don't have. Or right. we, we we do have it because we can look at look at current direction. We just ha don't have an event, so we so we can't. So we have to pull pull for it. Uh, and the, well, and we, the have, that right. we have we uh, have are not quite correlated to to the setting of current direction. Right. So I I think for <clears throat> um. Yes, yeah, so it is an option that you could say uh, you call add transceiver, <clears throat> or you set direction, and you <clears throat> you ask when is this done. I don't care; it'll just happen. The problem is it could actually take a while to happen. <clears throat> so, um, so I'm saying if we're assuming that application code, there's no application code out there that's written to care about when it actually happens or if it ever happens. Uh, we we probably don't need this, but I, I would question that. It seems odd to me to have an API where you're never really sure whether things are done yet. When there's, there's no time, there's no time to check other than basically uh, set timeout. No, no. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm saying that if you if you fire five ad transceivers, uh, then uh, what you care for each transceiver is that uh, is that it's usable. And so that's a transceiver related event, mm -hmm. not a negotiation related event. Negotiation is right, just right. in the background in order to make to make the transceiver usable. 
So, so you are saying that uh, that if we want to add anything here, we should uh, be thinking about adding ad adding a, a state change uh, or direction change event to the transceiver. So, so, well, so the other thing you could do is take proposal C and then just add some sort of property which says what is what's now complete. So you know when you when you get this. Uh, information when you get this event or what it, or a promise whatever we end up doing you mm. know which transceiver it is that's now good and you can then well, display it or undisplay it or whatever it is you're going to do with the ui i tend to agree with harold that you want to know what it is that you've just <laughs> got well well that's the idea of uh, you actually know because you have the closure of javascript right so <clears throat> in this case if you look at the literal example then uh we use a wait to wait and uh, we know the transceiver we're talking about is the one that we have in our closure. So that's the one we okay. care about. So, but and so then, then, it's still atta <laughs> attached to the PC, but you use the closure to find out where your what your context was. Yes. Uh, so okay. this is assumed that people write JavaScript. In the case Sorry. where you fire five add transceivers, three mm -hmm. of them catch the first train and two of them catch the last train. In this in, in proposal right. C, mm -hmm. you would fire the event after or or resolve the promise after number five has been uh, been transmitted while in let's call it proposal e you would fire <laughs> five events one for each transceiver exactly when uh, <clears throat> these, these things happen that's that's not correct that would be proposal a i think the first one you said the the benefit of proposal c <clears throat> is that it would actually resolve promises earlier for the transceivers uh, uh, that got negotiated earlier. No, proposal A is still based on based on a on, on a whole whole PC signaling. Right. Right. But if you if you call as you said, I transceiver five times. Uh, if let's say two of them caught the first train, then their closures, uh, their uh, if they each if this is like a button on click and it runs this exact code, then they would assert equals at the end of the first negotiation. <clears throat> Hmm. And then, you know, if you add transceiver, if there were a couple of transceivers that missed that train, they would get a certain equals on the second negotiation and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So I have no doubt that proposal C gives you all you need. It's just whether, I mean, we can go further, but it so sounds I, like people <clears throat> don't want to do any of this. So I, um, I think, I think, I think what the problems that this is solving, um, like it's a nice to have. I think, like, if you want to know, it, will this specific transceiver work? Uh, the combination of listening to, um, you know, set remote description and that stuff like when you get back to stable, and then looking at the connection state of the associated transports, and the you know the direction, <laughs> will get you this. It's just that this is a nice to have. I think when you're writing tests, and if you wanna, if you wanna de debug, like, hey, my application is broken what's going on, it would be very useful to know whether or not there is any negotiation that is needed, right? Like it's a nice to have, but I don't think it solves a problem that isn't already solvable with the existing APIs. So um, <clears throat> I would I would disagree there. Um, excuse me. Um, so you're saying that we could polyfill this, and I, I don't actually think that we can. <clears throat> the problem is that we now queue negotiation needed which means that <clears throat> I think before we did that, you could make a case that if if you came back to stable and then you queued a task and then you checked whether you'd gotten negotiation needed or not, if you didn't, you would know for sure that negotiation needed was not needed. However, now we queue negotiation needed, fi firing on the queue negotiation needed, which means that it could get stuck on the peer connection queue behind multiple other methods coming in, add, you know, add ICE candidate, other negotiation methods. So you know, so you have to wait longer. Uh, but there's no way to know how long you have to wait. Well, you're, you're still assuming that you want to look at negotiation needed, which we currently don't expose. I'm assuming that you have some way to examine the API through some mechanism other than uh, basically set timeout or waiting. Uh, having a while loop. Well, for each thing you want to know if it got mm -hmm. negotiated, you can 
you can just you make a change like add transceiver <clears throat> so you know something's needed and then you know the conditions that will have occurred once this has been negotiated <clears throat> so you can manually do some some tinkering and you'll know that that thing is done uh, if you do that for all the possible things that you could negotiate you would have this it would be <clears throat> A much more code it would be different code for different use cases uh, like add transceiver right. would be just what you care about is the direction but what if you do set streams well set streams right. or, or ice restart mm -hmm. you wouldn't need some different logic like okay if i do an ice restart i need to know that i've you know done one exchange without rolling back that's happened i'm okay. done etc so well, that's a good example go ahead so no, my point my point is is this is a nice like if if we want to do do this, this is a nice API that does it for mm -hmm. you. But I just want to say it's if we want just to test something or the big the debug something specific, I don't think it's needed. I think mm -hmm. it's nice, but I don't think it's needed. Well, <clears throat> uh, that's a good example you brought up. Set, set streams. We don't currently have a way to observe set streams locally, right? So let's say I want to set these new streams, and then I want to negotiate. And then out of band, I want to send a uh, signaling message to the other side and say, you know, look at your these um, things and do something with those streams. Like you have way, no way to know when the other side should see that. Just so, a note on time. We have a lot of other yeah. things to cover in the meeting. I think we <clears throat> kind of need to uh, right. move on. To well, let, let me the notice feature. the last part of this slide here. Then the bonus is okay. that. If we expose promise proposal C and we had this promise, you would actually have a way to also know whether you're still on the same negotiation train because you could compare a promise to the uh, re most recent negotiation complete promise attribute. And if they're the same, you would know for a fact you're still on the same negotiation train as you were earlier. <clears throat> All right. Up, oh, is it me? Yes. Uh, wait, uh, I don't think I've, I have a resolution to capture. Yeah, so, so, it sounds like there was no appetite to solve this problem. Mm, no, I, I think it's it's nice to have, but it's not needed for 1.0 um, to make so sure that. So is this a case of a WebRTC extension thing, or, yeah. or not even there? Um, not sure. I think it, it would be interesting to see whether uh, libraries based on top of uh, your connection API would actually uh, do something similar to that. And if we see that pattern being used a lot, then we should uh, implement it directly. But if it's not the case, yeah. then maybe we don't care. Okay. Yeah, the question is really whether this is functionality we just need for the tests or for, like real apps need it. I mean, I, like I think for debugging, it's it would really be nice to have. It's it's just yeah, one for of debugging. those. I'm I'm just skeptical about the effort versus benefit uh, from the implementation yeah. point of view, not the actual proposal itself. Yeah, I mean, as Harold said, in apps, I I've never seen anybody ask about this. They ask about other things, but not this. Right, but that's well, because they don't do perfect negotiations. So I don't think that's right. a fair fair right. point of criticism. Today, I think uh, applications have to be very involved with their own negotiation, so they and they inherently know what's going on. But their code is extremely complicated and probably full of races. At the same time, we, we are not in a hurry there. We, we can leave some time for app to uh, engage into uh, perfect negotiation, and then we can see whether they will come back to us or whether we, we are sure we need that or not. Hmm. Right. The, the, I have a general question there. How much time do we have? Because it sounds like well, we go to nine thirty. No, I, I meant I, I meant in the WebRTC working group because it sounds like some of us are working on the assumption that there will be time to address these things in the future, and at the same time, uh, our charter isn't necessarily extended for a full year even. So just uh, on the yeah, yeah. No. yeah, on the process bits, uh, the charter is expanded extended until September. Uh, only because so we were planning initially, as you may recall from TPAC, we were planning to do a proper recharter. But given the upcoming changes in the WCC process, we thought it was better to wait until the 
new process was available. So the plan is uh, once that new process is available, we go through a proper recharter for, as far as I can tell, a two years new charter. Uh, so that's for the formal bits. Uh, the real bit is that we continue as long as there are people ready to, to do the work. I, I mean, I, I can't imagine an API as rich and complex as WebRTC as being done. There is a ratio cost benefit that we have to evaluate and each of us evaluate in terms of participating or not. Uh, but yeah, there are many more improvements I'm sure the API will need uh, over the years. All right, thanks. All right, should I go? Go ahead. Okay, so issue. Uh, when are the effects of the in parallel stuff surfaced? Uh, this might sound like a silly question because the spec is written to say like in parallel do the thing and then when the thing is done you queue a task and you update things accordingly. So for example, uh, in parallel apply the SDP according to the JSAP rules and then if successful you queue a task and you update the set of transceivers and internal slots accordingly. So it seems like that's when things become observable, right? Well, then there, we have the ad track. So in JSON, it says uh, that if the peer connection is in high remote offer state, uh, the track will uh, be attached to the first compatible transceiver that has been cre created in the most recent set remote description call. That's, that's not like it, it. If you have a compatible transceiver that may have been created by set remote description, you could reuse that instead of creating a new transceiver. Uh, so things to note, JavaScript is supposedly single threaded and in the the peer connection has this internal slots and they're updated in tasks they have a, a, a set of transceivers and a signaling state um that they're not technically defined as internal slots i looked at the spec but they, they have a definition it says this, this set when the uh, peer connection is created and you look at through the entire spec it's it's get and set the specific points on the javascript thread but then we have the signaling thread and transceivers this a concept, concept that exists, exists in JSAP as well. So are these the same states or are they different? Uh, next slide. So the question is this, like if I do add track, um, like I do set re remote description with an SDP that would have created a transceiver that is compatible and I do add track after that without awaiting in between, will a new transceiver be created or not? Um, so yeah, has, has a, a compatible transceiver been created when ad track is executed? And I think there's two options. Like if ad track operates on WebRTC PC's definition of signaling state and set of transceivers, then the answer is clearly no. But if the ad track operates on this JSEP signaling state or set of transceivers, then maybe. Uh, next slide. Well, uh, are you taking comments now or? Uh, no, because your okay. comment will probably be, but aren't these the same states, the WebRTC PC and JSEP, aren't they the same states? That was my question, yes. Right, and I would say no, because if so, then PC.signaling state and PC.contransceivers are RACI APIs. And you could do a while, you know, you, you couldn't even loop through um, get transceivers using indexes because the, set, the, the number of transceivers could change in the middle of your uh, loop. <laughs> Because I, I think right, that's, go, not, go on. that's not true. So, but still, you know, might might add track surface uh, set remote description created uh, JSON transceivers to JavaScript, even if, you know. Um, so, what do we do today? Uh, in Chrome, set remote description will always create the transceiver first, and then add track will expose this. Uh, and while it's well defined, the, this means the JavaScript thread is blocked on in parallel work. So it's not truly in parallel. I, I think this is incorrect, but that's what we do. Uh, and in Firefox, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have mutexes and you know a shared set of, of objects. So if I understand things correctly, what happens is you have both of these. You have the JavaScript thread and the background thread, and there could be races. So add track may expose the transceiver. It's, it's non-blocking, but it's racy. So problem one is, is compatibility issues. Uh, and problem two is races. And you know problem three is this ex exposing the fact that JavaScript isn't single-threaded. Is that a concern? It's, it's a principle that we generally don't 
violate. So next slide. So proposal A is that uh, whether or not ad track should recycle a transceiver or create a new one should be a decision that is performed on the JavaScript thread. So on the JS, the WebRTC PCs set of transceivers. Uh, if we do this, then ad track is not dependent on JSUB states. And so there's no risk of surfacing these in parallel created objects. Uh, I believe that this is already what the spec says, because we, we do, it's well defined when we add and remove from these set of transceivers. So I think it, what's necessary is to clarify this. A problem though is that both Chrome and Firefox are non-compliant according to this. Uh, the alternative proposal uh, to, to you know, mix these uh, states would be to update the spec to allow the add track method to um, uh, add a, a, to the JavaScript set of transceiver. You add a transceiver that has been created in JSEP. So you're exposing something that happened in parallel by in the synchronous API. But then we would have to make it clear that uh, that this could be racy, uh, implementation specific, which transceiver you get, and that this we're violating this non-single threaded design principle and purpose. So what should we do? Well, <clears throat> so I'm not sure which is proposal A and which one is B actually from your descriptions, but I agree that um, we have racy behavior there. And I think I opened an issue earlier as well on, on JSET being racy. The problem, uh, taking a step back, JSET was written without thinking about threads at all. Yeah. And then WebRTC PC comes along and says, basically, we're going to run JSET entirely in parallel. And then yeah. later, we changed, we updated. And that used, I think, may have been in the past, there might have been a time where that was OK, because all the information was basically serialized through the description. But then I think at some point, maybe JSEP grew some, we added these ad track kludges, um, and it ends up referring to peer connection state from a background threat. And that is inherently racy. Um, and I the reason I, I'm confused is that because um, it's not less about whether it's on a JavaScript thread or not, because once we trigger something in parallel, that means uh, we return to JavaScript and JavaScript finishes. And then you know you, you might have another queue task uh, from a button click or something where you call add track. Or maybe you call add track immediately. Uh, you're still updating. You, that might update your our, our, uh, WTC's PC's set of transceivers. So and that, that can still race with JSEP if JSEP is referring to that set of transceivers. So I think the only way this can work is if we make copies of things. Yeah, and I think that's what like I think I think in my in my head <laughs> we have WebRTC PC JavaScript objects and there's there are these shallow <laughs> objects that refer to something that exists somewhere else on JSEP level. Uh, and so you can you can add transceiver, and you know that JSEP is going to create a transceiver. You don't have to wait for it. All the all the thing you're exposing to JavaScript is is synchronously available because you know it's just going to be a transceiver that has these initial values. That's fine. It's fine. The only problem is with add track because add track says, "Hey, you might want to recycle a, a transceiver." So then you have to know, well, is there a transceiver to recycle? The current spec. Examining, examines the WebRTC PC set of transceivers, which does not contain any JSEP created transceivers until this queued task. So I would say that if the ad track would may, would say, oh, I have no transceiver to, to recycle, so I'll create a new one. And then we just have, just have to tell JSEP that a new transceiver would be created. Right. But what happens in Chrome and, and Firefox is that maybe you get a transceiver that was already created, even though that wasn't visible before you called ad track. Yes. Uh, so clearly, the hygienic thing we would leap to almost instinctively would be to, I, I think, when we invoke JSEP in parallel, first copy off state and basically write something that says, you know, 
for the purposes of JSEP, look at these things, these copies, and don't don't you know keep JSEP away from our real set of transceivers that might change to avoid races. That's that's a typical way to solve racing. I use copying, for example. Um, so I don't even think you need races. to change the well, spec for proposal A. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, is that proposal A, making copies of everything? No, pro so proposal A is that the, the things that we, the, the set of transceiver objects that we have defined in WebRTC PC, they're defined and, and it's, it's modified and read to from the JavaScript thread, that that's a separate set. Yes. Okay. So, so that seems to be the hygienic option. The only problem I had, and what what stalled me on on when I first filed an issue like this, is that if you go back to the example you had originally with set remote description and uh, ad track, uh, and one more, I think. Yeah, there uh, that one. Uh, so you call set remote description and ad track. The question is, what what is the desired behavior? Now. If we were hygienic, we're gonna we would say that uh, this this new transceiver should not be picked up by the set remote description, correct? That's that's my proposal. Yes, the the that it would be clean. The only downside is that might leave a hole. In, yeah, but it, it would only leave it would only leave a hole if your application is has a race in it. Why should we support racy mm -hmm. applications? No, but think of a uh, perfect negotiation needed then. So ad track is a high level application method and you shouldn't need to know about where in the negotiation process you are. So you call ad track. Is that track always going to be picked up? It's either going to be picked up on this negotiation cycle or the next one. And that's fine. What I'm worried about is there's a tiny hole now where it won't be, be picked up by any, either of them. Um, I think that's fine. I think the alternative would be opening a can of worms where some internal slots are updated and some other aren't. And it's a bit, I don't know, I think we'd have to review the spec to see where can we do this without problems and where can't we do this. Okay. But I don't think you have a hole that it won't be picked up at all. The result of hitting the hole would be, would be to to have an have an extra transceiver, but but but, but here's the hold. There, there's code inside ad track, and there's code inside set remote description. And one is designed to catch um, ad track happening before set remote description, and the but other I, one is it's so designed to happen. The, there's code inside ad track to to say something like if there's a transceiver already, then attached to that. And I worry it wouldn't miss both. This problem, no. this this hole, and by hole it means, hey, we didn't attach to an existing transceiver, so we'll have to create a new one. So in perfect negotiation, you'd need another additional, possibly an additional round of negotiation, if you're unlucky. My point is, if we are in this situation, then we already have a race. So you're trying to optimize. What if we get lucky? I think. I, I don't. I don't I think. Uh... No, I think the idea with perfect negotiation is that you could there is no inopportune time to call ad track. No, right, right. Well, the, but as long as as long as ad track and set remote description are in two different uh, cycles, then there is no problem. Right. But, it's I, but I'm worried in the same, in the same <clears throat> cycle that uh, the 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 issue that Henrik raises can. Can, can yeah, I mean, even with perfect negotiation, you would be in a racist scenario where you are waiting for an imparallel operation to ex execute. <clears throat> like it's already a race. There's no way around it. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 this code couldn't exist when you're if if you're using this this code, then you're not using perfect negotiation. Okay. Um, I so, think. All right. Can we, if we had the next slide or the the final slide with the proposals? Um, I, 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 yeah, I think proposal A is the only sensible thing to do here, even though, like, I think the way to solve this without having to rewrite all the code would be that, you know, you have, you pass down a flag to the JSEP layer to say whether or not you allow, well, whether like either, either you don't, you create a new transceiver 
or you, you pass down a reference to the transceiver that you have already in, in the JavaScript layer determined, this is the one I'm going to recycle. OK, it's all right. Uh, uh, I think it's ready for a pull request. OK. OK. But, so uh, the, but to be clear, the, <laughs> if I understand things correctly, uh, a, a pull request would only clarify the what I already believe the spec is saying. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I don't think the spec is going in parallel components. So, uh, yes. yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think the spec is, uh, I think the spec is currently racy, right? Because <laughs> it says to run JSIP in parallel, and then JSIP refers back to signaling state. So that's an actual race. So we need normative yeah. change, not just notes, I think. Okay, I think it's right. it's up to the interpretation right now. Right, let's let's but let's take this okay. in a PR. Take it okay. to a PR. Let's go. go on. All right. Let's okay, All so right. uh, we're, we're now into media mm -hmm. capture. Yeah, just yeah. A second. Uh, uh, does that mean that implementation will get fixed? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean we would have to fix this behavior. Okay. But can we? So whether or not the spec says what it, what we wanted to say, can we? The the, the, con, the consensus we can note probably is that we do not want, uh, you know, get transceivers to be uh, racy. Right? Like we shouldn't expose, you know, if I call get transceivers in a loop in JavaScript, I shouldn't suddenly see a new transceiver object pop up. Right? Agree, yeah. All right. Yeah. OK. All right, so we're now on to media capture and streams. Uh, first discussion is uh, Sam on issue 671, new audio acquisition. So you have the floor, Sam. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sam. Uh, I'm an engineer at Microsoft uh, working on the HTML platform. Um, and so, the this is basically a kind of a mixture of a feature request slash, slash issue that we found uh, with the spec. Um, we got an ask for basically as the specification stands today, um, it's kind of hard for developers to differentiate between streams that are meant for uh, speech recognition and for communication. And so um, we're we're aware of the current content in specification that has uh, different categories. Um, but this has more to do with changing the actual uh, stream. And so um, currently, it seems like the current implementations are geared a little bit towards communications. Um, but in general, communications can actually hurt speech recognition. Um, and so and vice versa. So when something is made for communications, um, often there can be things like, you know, um, noise added to the communication to make it sound a little bit better to the ear. And that can kind of distract if you have a um, speech recognition engine on the other side, trying to uh, listen to the signal itself. Uh, so next slide. Um, so here are some of the kind of differences uh, that we found uh, between communications audio and uh, audio for speech recognition. Um, and so these are coming from uh, specs from Etsy. Um, and so you can read through them, but um, the basic I idea is that um, you can see like ambient noise is different. Um, in speech recognition, you're cutting all of it out. In communications, you're trying to make it sound good. Uh, so next slide. And these are more examples of the differences. Um, gain control is also mentioned. Um, and so next slide. And so, so something that was, is also uh, something that was mentioned, uh, we brought this issue up a couple of times, uh, is that testing is hard. 
And so that's why we found some of the um, standards that were linked above to show kind of exactly what we're trying to change with this new proposal. Uh, so the first proposal is, uh, let's add a new constraint called category. Um, and the, the that specific name is kind of open, uh, but that allows you to specify uh, kind of specific category values of default, raw communication or speech, uh, or maybe speech recognition. And so this kind of like fits well into the existing constraint model. Uh, it also has very straightforward translation to implementation on multiple platforms. Uh, we did some research and um, Windows, iOS, Android, uh, all have very um, similar kind of categories like this. So if you wanted to uh, get streams from the device that had these uh, different uh, constraints added to them, it would be pretty easy to do. Uh, the problem is that this kind of competes with the existing content hint draft uh, in a way that's a little bit confusing. Uh, the content hint seems to be um, like centered around setting different constraints or defaults for constraints, and then also providing hints uh, to consumers of streams. Whereas this um, is is a little bit, it is again geared towards setting optimizations on the stream itself. Uh, things more like, more specific, like different levels of echo cancellation. Um, so next slide, our second proposal is um, modifying constraints like echo cancellation to be a little bit more specific. Um, and so they would follow some of the um, differences that were outlined in the original, the slide, the previous slides. Um, and then from there, we'd be able to add new hints to the content hint draft, uh, which could use these more specific uh, labels for echo cancellation. And so the pros for this one are that it fits in well with the existing content hint draft. Um, and it could allow for more developer freedom, uh, but the implementation route is like currently not as clear um, for the uh, uh, the first proposal. It's easy as setting a flag. Uh, for this one, uh, I have to dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, it might just be setting a flag as well, um, but there might be more to do here. Um, so th those are those are my thoughts. And so I guess the ask here is um, kind of to get like consensus that there is a sort of issue here for developers uh, who might want to differentiate between these two um, types of streams and then kind of get a better idea of what might be the right way to move forward. So just to clarify, you it's not that you want to turn off echo cancellation because you want to do speech recognition. You, you still want echo cancellation, you just want it to be less aggressive perhaps uh, or different parameters. Yeah, and so the table kind of helps with um, like more specific, more specificity here. Um, but for like echo, if you see the difference, there's like a difference kind of like tolerance level of echo cancellation. Um, and so it would, it would be changing it to kind of uh, have these different tolerances. Because right, right now it's a Boolean, right? It's on or it's off. So that, that was one thing that made me wonder. You stated on on uh, slide twenty four that uh, your proposal for a new constraint fits in well with the existing constraint model, and I don't understand how it fits well, given that you are saying that if we have this new constraints, uh, then uh, then that should affect. Uh, a number of things that are controlled by other constraints in non-obvious ways. 
So what, what do you mean by it fits with well in the existing constraint model? Yeah, I guess uh, for that one, it was, it fits, maybe it, it fits easier in that it's easy to implement with get user media. Um, it, it seems to fit what, and what like a consumer might expect, but it, it, it does, you're right in that it does kind of conflict with other constraints. Yeah, but what, what um, do you mean by it fits better with get user Get, fits with get user media. I mean, when you when you go, do get user media towards a, an, an ask for a, for a microphone, what would you actually change based on this constraint? In what case would you choose a different microphone? Yeah, it doesn't. It's it's not about choosing a different device. No, um, that that's actually not possible in any implementation with audio constraints, as I know. Uh, like, the audio okay. constraints, like, and you don't really want to pick uh, microphone. I mean, you could do that, but I don't think anyone implements it because most people implement uh, echo cancellation in software, noise suppression in software. Uh, I don't think anyone supports, you know, hardware noise cancellation control through these constraints, for example. Right, but get, get user media constraints as multi-purpose. Like, part of it is choosing. Uh, devices, but part of it is also yeah. just if adding or disabling but effects. Remember, kind of where we're going with the in-browser picker, right, that the device selection part of it is eventually going to go away. So, Well, yeah, get use media started as a device exploration API. It's become something else where you can modify a source. And you can also clone a track. So I think my question here would be, what's the use case that isn't solved by the following? Uh, you get user media. You turn off echo cancellation. You turn off noise suppression. You turn off auto gain control, and uh, you feed that to your speech recognition software. Or if, if uh, alternatively, let's say you want to do speech recognition and WebRTC call, you call Get User Media. You with uh, you send that track to peer connection, whatever, and then you clone that track. Turn off all the things I mentioned earlier and send that to the speech recognition software. Yeah, it's not it's not just on or off though. I think that's what this chart is saying. Well, uh, I, I don't understand when you would want echo cancellation uh, for speech speech recognition. Or well, when the recognizer answers you back, like Alexa, but remote. That's is that echo. Um, so okay. you don't you don't want it to hear you don't want Alexa to hear herself, right? Yeah, actually, Alexa is using something like this, isn't it, Sam? Uh, yeah. So when we talked to the uh, team that kind of does is, is working with uh, other speech recognition teams to kind of come up with this uh, draft standard that is linked um, about requirements for. Uh, speech recognition systems. Uh, they mentioned that uh, currently Amazon is kind of uh, rolling their own for the um, for for their version of this. So they're kind of doing the same, the thing that you mentioned, where they're turning off everything and then adding their own um, optimizations for speech recognition. And so I guess the you're right that you can already kind of you can already do that right you can turn everything off and then add your own optimizations um kind of the idea here is to allow there to be uh optimizations already there so that you um not everyone has to do their own thing so um, i i do you know any system that has like multiple echo consider and apps can choose one of them for instance, or because, for instance, on the macOS iOS, I, I believe there's only one echo canceller for provided by the OS, and then apps can do whatever they want. But there are not like multiple echo cancellers that can be selected, or even parameters. Yeah, so that that has to do with um, so in the second proposal, I said that the the implementation is not as straightforward if we do individual constraints. Uh, even though I think it fits in better with the uh, current 
API and that it, it doesn't cause any com conflicts or anything like that. Um, the you're you're correct in that. Um, for example, iOS in terms of um, like echo cancellation only offers that one boolean that you can turn on or off. The idea here would be. Um, So the, way, so the way I see things is like with echo suppression, you the only control knob is on or off. Uh, if there was a way to actually control it more specifically, you'd probably just do that. And then, right, the, the benefit of saying having this category is that the vagueness, the vagueness means you can probably try it out and try to just tweak the implementation to support your use case. But the downside of it is when it's a hint is that, well, it's just a hint. So it's, it's not very well defined. Like you can say, yeah, this stream is, should be used for this, but it's very exploratory, like how to implement using that constraint. Uh, uh we also expect, uh, I, I would also expect to see a wide variety between platforms on the implementation of this because there's no way you're going to get, uh, I think there's no way that you're going to get an uh, agreed spec on exactly what should be done. Right, but like you could say that that's already the case for echo cancellation true. Oh yes, that's yeah. Uh, so, yeah. we, we've been, we reinvented echo cancellation three times in WebRTC without anyone noticing. I think. Or I hope someone noticed. So the way I, I mean, the path towards, like, ideally everything should just see like this is the thing you're tweaking, and when you tweak that, it has this behavior. And whenever possible, that's the direction we should go. But if something is very hard to describe and it's very implementation specific how you do it uh then it's hard to hard to uh propose something that it doesn't sound like a hint or you know true or false and then so i think what's true here is that uh it's a good observation that w current implementations of echo cancellation noise uh, cancellation and auto gain are Vendors have implemented them toward with communication in mind. I think that's fair to say. I don't know that we're going to get commitments from browser implementers to implement different new forms of echo cancellation for the purposes of speech. Right? Are we? Is that what this is asking for? Um. I guess, yeah, um, so it would be asking people, so proposal two would be asking people to add different levels of uh, echo cancellation for um, the purposes of speech, or at least the, the roughly the categories that were uh, proposed. Yeah, speech, um, and speech is uh, a bad label because uh, uh, what you want here is uh, is uh, preserving the artifacts that uh, that recognize this trigger off. And as you, as you noted in the uh, echoes with this switching, these are different from what, what humans do. So we so you you want to have processing that is different from different from what. Uh, what the processing is for speech in general. We also have music, which is which has its own set of set of uh, requirements. Like one of the major points in music is that you definitely don't want uh, time varying frequency, the wow sounds that you frequently get with over eager data buffers. So with uh, with interrupt interoperability in my in mind like I, I think the echo cancellation colon true 
worked not in the sense that it does the same thing, but it worked in the sense that everyone wanted to solve this problem, so everyone did their best job at echo cancellation. Um, if you want to sort of tweak things even more, um, I think if again, if you want the same successful uh, story where you add something and then everyone implements something like that, you need to either make, I think either make it so like well-defined enough where you can say this is passes or fails, like this is the parameter, um, or you need like commitment where people are actively trying to solve this problem, uh, I guess. Because otherwise you might end up in a case where it's working in one browser, but not the other browsers. Uh, and it's too, it's very vague whether or not, like what should happen. So uh, there's different paths you could take. One is, is uh, we have a, a problem that we all want to solve and we, we move towards that direction, either through specific parameters or like a category where we, we optimize for a specific use case. Or I guess the other alternative would be that you do you just turn everything off and you try to solve this in like WebAssembly to ensure they interrupt. Uh, or, or web audio. Or web audio. Probably web audio firing web assembly. <laughs> I right. want to throw in one kind of other category here that 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 is kind of getting more interesting, which is mm, broadcast. So so you've got two categories there of communications and speech rec, but but I think there's a third one which is you know audio that's subsequently going to get broadcast, and that that's getting trendy at the moment. And there's a lot of it going on. Um, so I think I think making this like a a switch, a two-state switch, would be the wrong solution. It needs to be something that has like multiple possible states. And I, um, right, certainly, kind of doing. We've been doing stuff with with podcast recording, and the, and what you want from the audio from that is different. I don't have a table entry like this, but but it is a different set of uh, things that you want to do if you're recording a podcast over over this. Hmm. But. Um... Is there anything here that could not be solved with web audio or audio workloads? Um, I think I'd have to take another look at that one. Um, and we have web audio, audio workloads and uh, a processing mode of uh, raw or as the uh, as little damage as possible. I would also look at the various implementation of ambient noise or echo cancellation. And if they are open source ones and you find like parameters, high level parameters that are somehow consistent between the different implementation, maybe that's a good start. Uh, to think about those parameters and whether they can be defined somehow. And then if we have a definition, then we can try to expose them. At least some browsers can, can try to do it. Yeah. Okay. It, well, thank you for your uh, feedback. It sounds like you guys are kind of leaning towards the second proposal, uh, which is more specific, um, like levels for things like echo cancellation and noise suppression. Um, Would that involve moving, making them? enums or something that could have different values or i'm just wondering what the feedback from the group is because we're basically saying on and off isn't enough but how would you you know uh, provide other um, i guess it would depend on the uh, thing you're trying to change like this i think the first proposal was a bit of a catch-all like my stream is going to be used for this and then it's a table of things it changes but uh I think you'd have to go through the list and say, is this something where it uh, um, can be expressed as like decibel? Or is this something where an ENA makes sense? I don't think I'm well versed enough to have an opinion there. And uh, I guess part of the feedback I'm hearing as well is uh, maybe this should be done in user land first uh, with web audio, web assembly, and stuff. 
And once we see enough patterns emerge, enough optimization that can be done uh, at the browser level, then maybe we'll have a better sense of what the right API, the right shape of the API should be. I mean, uh, I guess it's a difference between making the possible easy versus making the impossible possible. And from what I'm hearing here, uh, it's, we are in the first case. It's already possible, but it's a pain. Um, and that's a problem worth fixing, but at a different pace, I think, than making the impossible possible. Okay. Uh, is there any any other thoughts? Uh, I think for the next step, I think there's stuff that we have to look into that uh, you guys have brought up. And so uh, from there, I think it'll be to update the issue as we find new things. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? Oh, yeah. Given that we already have a co collection of uh, hints that are little more than hints in the content hints uh, document, that nonetheless people have found useful, it's kind of it's kind of an easy easy thing to do to, to drop it in there and let people see if they can uh, they can pick it up there, pick it up from there. Yeah, the concern there is that how does that turn into Browser implementer, uh, you know, intent to implement anything, and uh, is that web compatible? Right, right. Because well, also if, if content you, hints um, don't really affect get user media devices, right? They're kind of more uh, downstream. No, uh, well, uh, you set them on a stream, and the stream is so what is uh, connected to that. <laughs> I mean, when you so you're saying you would do get user media then. Instead of like applying constraints, you would set a hint, and somehow that would go into the propagate into the device. That's how it works. No, yeah. uh, some of that would propagate into the audio processing that has, has applied to the stream, applied to the track. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. The same, the same way as uh, mm. as apply constraints. And now all the existing content hints for audio are expressed in the way that they they turn and modify. The constrainable property stuff. So, if we if we're thinking about right, adding new hits, right. uh, maybe we should similarly think about adding uh, speech specific uh, new constraints and and some extensions back. But um, otherwise, I worry that uh, how, how's that, how are you going to write your application? Otherwise, it's going to be like you know, if Chrome, then we're going to trust that this constraint gives us. Well, I guess you would use exact constraints then, and you would look for over constraint error. Is that the thinking? <laughs> you, can't, you can't detect uh, constraints that way. Well, um, you would have to check if if is supported for the application, and, and if, if the new constraint is supported, and you get an, well, actually, no, you don't have to do that, anymore, because if you get over constraint error, yeah. So if it's neither there, neither supported, and you get over constraint error, then you know it's not. Yeah, that doesn't work. No, no, it doesn't work that way. No, that's, that's why You're we right. added, added is is supported. So you can, can tease out a particular implementation's functionality this way, but you can't know for sure without feature uh, user agent or a feature detecting, uh, vendor browser vendor detecting. Yeah. So we have 10 with minutes a, of the uh, end of the call. Yeah. I was about to say that I think you can feature detect uh, values for content hints by, by simply setting the hint you want and see see if it, got, it had an effect. Uh, well, <laughs> that's the way. Yeah. Do. Supposed to work as attributes. I think. All right. I I think we've gotten a, a decent amount of feedback to work off of. Um, 
maybe we move on. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Okay, you went. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So nowadays, we we all know that all powerful APIs are restricted on user gesture, basically. Uh, it's particularly the case for media APIs, for instance. Uh, playing audio is nowadays restricted. Device orientation is restricted. Get it media is restricted. So <clears throat> I think there's consensus that should we have to design get to media now, uh, we would probably add the same restrictions. Now we could try to do that, and that would break websites, and they will not be happy. So we, we cannot do it uh, in this manner. So the question I'm asking there is how we can transition to to that restriction. Uh, are there measures that would allow us to um, progressively enforce that restriction and make websites migrate to uh, uh, respecting that restriction that get to the media should be uh, called on a user gesture? Um, so I, I find a few possibilities. Uh, one observation is that usually um, a website will call get to the media either on page load, basically, so very, at the very beginning, on a, or on a user gesture. So we, we could try to enforce user gesture after page is finished loading, for instance. Um, the second thing is that um, in page loading case or over non-user gesture uh, cases, we could add a prompt in cases where get user media would not prompt. Um, typically. So in that case, uh, we would not deny initially uh, get to the media if it falls from a user gesture, but we will we would enforce a prompt. Uh, that would give some incentive for websites to actually start applying the user gesture uh, restriction. Um, I looked at a few websites. So for instance, whereby.com is a good example where you apply the restriction, nothing is breaking, nothing is changing. It's, it's the same workflow. Uh, it, it, it works well. If you look at Hangout or Meet, uh, they have this enter uh, meeting room, uh, but they are calling get to the media on page, on page load. Um, so there, there would be a, a need for some adoption there. And we, we cannot ship the friction as is. Um, so, I was thinking that we, we could try to um, try to enforce these restrictions. Um, the two I'm mentioning, meaning that we we start implementing user gesture uh, required on after page load, basically, and also uh, if there's no user gesture, then you you need to uh, show a prompt, basically. Um, I I think. I'd like your feedback there, whether that's something that could be done. And uh, I would be also interested if there's uh, interest in the working group, maybe to talk a little bit with some uh, WebRTC website developers to, to see what they think about it. So, is, uh, go ahead. Is the requirement, like if, if user gesture is not happened, is the requirement to deny, like to reject the promise, or is the requirement that you prompt, like you have to uh, read? Meaning the proposal there, or in general, where we want to go? Uh, both, I guess. So if you look at uh, where you want to go, uh, if there's no user gesture and uh, somebody, is a web app is trying to play audio, then it will be rejected. If you try to get display media, it will be rejected. If you want to get access to device orientation, it will be rejected. Well, I mean, I'm just so, thinking where if you have a asynchronous API, so it would be very easy to await something, and then you suddenly you don't have user gesture anymore, even though it was actually triggered by a user gesture. So, so it's true so that you, user gesture is something that is not well defined at all, meaning that in some browsers, there's this notion of you click, and then for a few, uh, Seconds, not not maybe just one second. For instance, there will be a user gesture. For instance, uh, it's it's a heuristic currently, so, and it's not cross-browser 
uh, consistent. But there's, there's an effort there to try to define it and I have something there. But for sure, if you're, synchron if you're synchronously calling uh, something based on user, user gesture, it will work. If it's not synchronous, then it might fail. Um, okay. so, it's it sounds like I can, uh, the idea to enforce use of gesture sounds like a good idea, but I think it's we it needs to be more well defined. And I think this also would well, it depends on where we go with some of the other uh, like with you, this uh, user chooses like what's going to end up happening there. True, but that may or may not solve this. Uh, if, you, if you look at get display media, for instance, which is very similar to get user media, right? It's uh, you try to get a, a video feed. Uh, it's not a camera, it's a screen. That's really it's, uh, it's roughly equivalent. Then we apply a uh, user gesture. And it's shipping in Safari, and all websites, I believe, are supporting it. So it's true that, for instance, uh, initially uh, it was failing on some websites, and they, they were trying to do it, and they were waiting a little bit, uh, and then it was failing. But they, they found solution to, to fix it. And now it's, it's working in Safari, and we, we should have the description it, it's working. There's no issue there. So I, I think it, it, you could probably do the same for get you the So I, I think I'm, uh, I like the direction of this. Um, and I think we, should, we could even uh, describe it as more of a uh, pr privacy and security issue, because I believe there are current problems uh on the web with, especially with feature policy here that um, um this means that there's a privacy escalation problem you, ha you have uh where someone could gain camera access now through navigation because you can set window location and you know i could for instance until a couple of days ago for js fiddle uh js fiddle used a star and it's an allow list which means it grants camera to to anything that it iframes so you, I could actually, from my malicious site, I could, when the user, when I know the user is not looking, I could navigate to my own fiddle, uh, and J, to my own JS fiddle, and that would basically escalate me up to get camera and microphone permission by redirecting back to my site in an iframe at JS fiddle, and then I'm I'm able to access the camera. So I think uh, that the, so I, I think this is quite necessary. Um, to go this direction. And I like the idea of uh, starting with um, prompting because that would, that would mitigate the, the immediate problems, I think, without too much discussion. Um, I think whether we get to uh, denying requests outright, I think that's a long-term goal. I don't know how I feel about that at the moment. There's a counter case where, and also I'm wondering if we could, uh, how specific the spec needs to be, because I'm also wondering whether browsers, user agents could detect whether a navigation happens across origin. So that uh, I think Harl mentioned a case where there might be websites that actually invoke page navigation within their own site in order to jump into a room and maybe be unfortunate if people got extra prompts in those cases. Yeah, I, I mean, but, but that's true that uh, user gesture is not well defined, and that leaves some uh, freedom from, for browsers. Uh, inside a browser, like Safari, for instance, user gesture has different meanings based on the API as well, uh, which is unfortunate, but uh, we are trying to be more, more consistent by this return state. So I, I don't see why other browsers could not have uh, the same approach. Uh, so. So my big worry about everything like this is uh, where, how much how much legitimate usage do we break? So I would say that uh, before we progress this any further, someone should have a browser in the field with a with a counter on it saying. Uh, how much you, how much usage do we have of get user media without a without a user gesture and how much do we have with a user gesture already present? 
-hmm. I would, I mean, if, if it's 99% of one and 1% of the other, it's no big deal. If it's 50, 50, then uh, it's a huge backwards compatibility problem. I think that for instance, WebEx and, WebEx and Hangout are uh, calling get you the media on page load. So, uh, and these are probably uh, important clients that would uh, change a lot of uh, dynamics of the percentage there. So clearly it's, it's a thing we should be very cautious as we uh, move out there. And uh, getting feedback from uh, top site would, would definitely help, I guess. Yep. So let's, sh shall we just say that we, that so, someone is going to get data and uh, present data at a later meeting? I don't think that Safari can collect that data. It's too difficult. Uh, I'm happy if somebody can can do it. Um, I, I I can try to uh, reach out to some uh, top site developers and, and get their feedback there. Yeah, Neva, do you think anyone uh, at Mozilla is interested in collecting this data? Um. Well, that, that would have to fit our definition of user gesture then, right? So I mean, that's, um, um, <laughs> that's the power of the yeah. one who gets a measure. <laughs> but I don't know if, I, well, we could see if we could add some telemetry maybe. But I, I do also worry about how to read those numbers, because uh, if we have web platform tests, I guess they all use fake camera now. So uh, yeah. that's doable. I, I can look, but I, I can't commit to resources at the moment. Uh, I mean, uh, at the moment, we're, uh, everyone is rather focused on making sure video, audio and video remains stable and everything, mm. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Yeah. Sure. Uh, we, Same here. In Safari, we, we don't plan to ship it in two weeks from now. <laughs> yeah. oh. More info needed. Uh, okay. So how are we doing on time? Are we going over time or are we, are we cutting it short? There's oh, three more I, issues. I think, I like think we have to cut it short. I have to leave. Hmm. OK. So we didn't get to see the bird. So next, uh, next one is in, uh, ne next, next one, next VI will be probably be in the mm -hmm. maybe I which might have happen in April. Hmm. Let's see. Okay. See you. Okay. All right. See you next time. Bye. Right. Say it. Um, let's stop the recording once I find the button. Bye-bye.